Corey, it's great to be here for this debate. We promised the people a debate, so we, we have to make sure to mix in some debating. Um, I'm Heather Hurlbert, not a stranger to consumers of the Robert Wright Media Multiverse, uh, blogging heads and other fora. I run a project called New Models of Policy Change at New America, and um, I, these days, am describing myself as a progressive internationalist, by which I mean I am too internationalist for the progressives and too progressive for the liberal internationalists. <laughs> and I'm Corey Shockey, friend of Heather Hurlbert and director of the Foreign and Defense Policy Studies Program at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm the author of a book about hegemonic power transition called Safe Passage, and I would describe myself as a conservative internationalist, somebody uh, who meets Heather's description, not conservative enough for conservatives and not internationalist enough for internationalists, uh, because I think that the United States is traditionally and rightly very skeptical about international commitments and about um, about international cooperation. And yet I think the lesson of the 20th century is that without those things, uh, threats gather and become much more dangerous and much more costly to address. So why don't we start from a real kind of ground zero question? We were chatting before we got on about the role of the state. And the hilarious thing is that I, coming from a progressive perspective, of course, have heard for years both our friends, the Marxists, and our friends, the global governance people, say that the state would wither away and be replaced by international institutions. You were pointing out, Corey, that there's now kind of an interesting case on the right that the state withers away. So, and then I think we're going to disappoint the viewers by both rolling our eyes at this one. But what's the, what's the conservative case for the death of the state? Yeah, so there, uh, I'm home in California for the summer, and here in the neighborhood of Silicon Valley, there's so much excitement about how technology saved us. Mark Andreessen famously posted about this. Technology saved us where governments failed during the pandemic. Um, and, and a real excitement about cryptocurrencies emerging as an alternative to either the dollar dominance of the international order or as repositories of value uh, as holding currencies. And I have to say, I think uh, both cases are very badly flawed. Uh, with cryptocurrencies, I just don't see why states which continue to have the ability to regulate their physical and virtual space are going to let cryptocurrencies go unregulated. Seems to me that they're very quickly going to set, states are going to set um, standards that you are required to meet in order to conduct commerce, because that's what states do. But does it look different to you, Heather? Well, I, this is where the sort of the observationist in me takes over and says we can observe around the world the last 15, 20 years a bit of a renaissance of the state, which I'm not necessarily happy about um, for my own liberal reasons. But it's just ahistoric and wrong to think that that the state has withered away or that there's less enthusiasm for the kind of state power you describe in crypto and in other areas. Um, at the same time, though, there's no question that the battle between the state, say the state and the issuers of cryptocurrency is going to be very interesting, right? Just like the battle between the state and the owners of data in Western societies where the state doesn't already own the data is going to be really interesting. Or the battle between the state and civic forces over land, um, the battle mm -hmm. between states and restive groups that don't want to be part of the state. So for all those reasons, my complicated left of center view is that we 
need systems and ways of thinking that are less state focused than what we have now that we kind of prepare for hybrid or all of the above international governance that and unfortunately and you know where what may where we may find a core disagreement is none of this means that we get to have less governance that we have to think more about how to govern more kinds of entities and spaces ones that are the realm of the state and others that are not the realm of the state, but that you still don't want to be ungoverned. Can you give me an example of one of those? So the original promise of the internet, for example, right, was that it was not going to require state governance data, was going to data, ideas, relationships, connections were going to flow freely. And we even had a period where that sort of worked where you did have international management of things internet by a global consortium that was non-governmental. But then at a certain point, states, chiefly but not only authoritarian states, well, states woke up and said, hey, you know, this is an area of power that we do not like having existing independently alongside us, which is exactly how you would predict that states would behave. But then, frankly, also, Western states in response have now said, hey, if, um, if Beijing and Moscow are going to exercise control and then teach other states to exercise control over data and to use data as an element of state power in this way, then we need to do the same thing. So you now see all over the state moving into that sector. But, and here you may have an interesting California and or libertarian pushback to me, but I also, I just suspect that the corporate world is not going to go down that quietly before any state and we're going to be stuck with a hybrid system. So I think we're going to get a state system. Um, and uh, and we probably should get a state system because I don't feel any better about the big tech five being able to establish who gets to be on Twitter or um, what kind of ads Facebook can take without being publicly accountable for the money, which I think is having an enormous effect on the quality of our democracy, right? So, so I think that's one thing, which is that what businesses don't have and what civil society activist groups don't have that states do have. And this is the reason I think that states are, will continue to be the way we organize and the only true enforcement mechanism internationally is because they have unique legitimacy because they have the ability to decide among competing interests, to set social values, and those social values either get affirmed or rejected uh, in free societies by their publics. Um, but, you know, for the, does the campaign to ban landmines matter more than the cost of defending South Korea if you can't mine the border against invasion? Um, governments are the place where those trade-offs get made. And I feel a lot more comfortable, even as dumb and reckless as Congress almost always is, I feel a lot more comfortable with elected representatives making judgments than Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg making judgments about what are the rules by which you can take money that has political influence um, and what is your accountability to the public for those things. So I do think there are new challenges emerging, but there's no at least I don't see any legitimate alternative to the state as the place where we aggregate preferences and prioritize outcomes. So two different, I want to pursue two different strands coming off of that. And one is to push back on you a bit about enforcement. Um, not because I am a starry eyed optimist about the quality of non-governmental enforcement, but rather because I'm such a pessimist about the, the record of enforcement by states in recent years. 
So that I think, um, and I think of Xinjiang cotton as an interesting example, where certainly the Biden administration is now looking at ways to pursue um, state level enforcement. Cotton is one area, solar panels is another. Um, is that happening because there, should we understand what has already happened in the private sector and civil society and what civil society has been able to pull off um, by scaring the heck out of Nike, for example, at various times in the past? Um, what's really the more effective? What's the actual enforcement mechanism and what's the lagging indicator? I, I think you are looking for a conceptual clarity that doesn't exist, Heather. Um, and I'm super sympathetic to it because when I was a little kid, the job I wanted to have when I grew up was to be the person who got to make up words that go in the dictionary. And it never occurred to me that words migrate from usage into the dictionary. I wanted a top-down approach where I got to have the fun of invention. Um, and there's some of that, right? Like the way that we grab onto words from other languages. Um, but mostly usage is how it happens. It's a two-way exchange. And I think the example you used is perfect, right? Um, the United States government would probably have moved to sanction um, China produce, cotton produced in Xinjiang uh, for two reasons. First, because we are, you know, the promotion of human rights, uh, there are truths we hold to be self-evident. And when we do our best work internationally, it is motivated by our domestic political values. Um, and second of all, because we're now really nervous about a rising China reshaping the international order in ways that mean human rights don't matter and, and governments aren't accountable. So for two reasons, the United States may well have done that anyway, but a lot more societies than the United States are doing it. And the American government will have a much easier job doing it because of the social activism. You know, the United States, because our government has such limited powers, has a much more vibrant civil society than many other places, right? It's easier to push our government around from civil society than many other governments. And that's a beautiful thing about our country. But it's also true that our government very often doesn't move unless pushed by civil society. Um, and I think the example we're seeing now about growing awareness of Chinese behavior in Xinjiang and other places is driving up the cost to governments and to businesses that uh, would prefer to avert their eyes and just make money. So just to give one final example, then I'll stop. Uh, you know, Germany uh, very much wants a stable, uncomplicated relationship with China. And German businesses want that more than most. But there is, I think, literally no way Volkswagen, with its history, can continue to build cars using labor in Xinjiang, right? That what is happening is civil society is spreading the word and it's going to make business impossible for Volkswagen in Xinjiang because it's going to bring up a whole bunch of unpleasant memories about previous governments that Volkswagen has wanted not to be accountable for their choices. So to my mind, what you've just said actually is an argument for my case that enforcement is a, is a multifarious thing. Um, and not, and no longer the sole or, you know, in some sectors, no longer the primary province of the state. But you've also raised China policy, which, um, is something that is a, a, a hotly debated topic in the U.S. right now. Um, so I was saying to somebody recently that I found myself in the odd position of saying, 
that I feel like I occupy the mushy middle on China where bizarrely I am joined by Bernie Sanders, who is not someone you think of as being in the mushy middle. No. Um, but um, what I mean by that is it has to be possible to say both that the government of China is promoting a system that is inimical to the U.S. and to things we value. And it should not be that that should not be left uncontested, both for the good of our own society and for the for the global good. But that that doesn't mean that we should be contesting China in every domain all the time. And it doesn't mean that we should be content. We should be conceptualizing. We should be understanding everything we do in the U.S. as um, pulling ourselves up to take on this kind of epic final World War II quality struggle against Beijing. And that, I find, leaves me in the mushy middle. Although it's a very small mushy middle these days in Washington. So I agree that, um, uh, that we shouldn't become China in order to protect ourselves from China. So there are lots of areas in which uh, I think we have competition with China, and it's by highlighting the differences. You know, here in Sonoma Cali County, California, we don't have um, speed cameras because even though our police would very much like to stop the epidemic of speeding by people like me in Sonoma County, um, the people of Sonoma County actually think a a cop should have to catch us speeding in order to be able to give us a ticket. And so don't have speeding cameras here in Sonoma County, California. Um, I wouldn't have the option of limiting either the collection of data by my government or how they choose to police me if I were Chinese. And, and, so we shouldn't compete with them for the most efficient way to, um, to give tickets to speeders. We should compete to them by doubling down on what's great about our own system. Um, and to the extent we do what we are capable of best, uh, then I do think we have to worry a lot less about other elements that we're worried about about China. But I don't read Senator Sanders' uh, argument quite the way you described it, Heather. Um, I read Senator Sanders' op-ed piece as him saying, uh, these militarists are driving us into conflict with China, and we shouldn't be. And I stridently disagree with that. Uh, you know, I think for... 40 years, the United States had our preferred strategy towards China, which was the responsible stakeholder, that we want to see a powerful, prosperous China, because that's good for us as well as good for them. Um, and the problem with that is that's not at least what this Chinese government wants. They want to change the rules in ways detrimental to the United States and other states and preferential to China. They want to export a model of domestic repression that is going to make the international order more dangerous for the United States. Um, and they are the ones pushing a military confrontation. The United States is simply continuing to uh, keep freedom of navigation free. Um, and it's not a U.S.-China competition, as Senator Sanders tries to make it sound. It's the U.S. plus just about everybody else saying we want to sustain the current rules, and China is making it more dangerous to do so. I'm so relieved we found something we stridently disagree <laughs> about, Corey. I was getting worried there for a minute. Um, the funny thing is that I actually quite agree with you about what Beijing is doing, which puts me on one side of the spectrum in Washington. But it is observable both that our Asian allies, who I, you are right, are also very concerned about what China is doing, 
but they are not out there with us on the full extent of some of what's being discussed militarily, nor are they out there with us to the full extent of some of what's being discussed economically. So we are in this interesting and challenging situation, not unknown to students of alliances throughout the centuries, such as yourself, um, where our position on the neighborhood is more hawkish than that of the people who actually have to live in the neighborhood. And so that is where, that is one of the two places where, to my mind, we are going too far and Sanders' critique is useful. The other um, is, and I just lost my train of thought, and I really hate when that happens, so I'm just going to admit it. So argue back against me on the first one, and then I'll come back on my second one. Okay. Um, I'll even suggest where I thought your second one was going, which is if allies are so worried about China, why aren't they doing more about it? Oh, that argument bores me to tears. I actually wasn't going to okay. have that one, but we def but we can, if you want to take that position. I, <laughs> <laughs> I am not a brave enough woman to risk boring you, Heather Hurlburt. Um, so on your first one, it's true that United, that the United States is more hawkish than many of its allies are on this. Um, but I don't think that means the United States should be less hawkish for two reasons. First, because there is a difference in perspective. If you are a power that believes you have the ability to sustain your interests and countries that don't, right? So um, the government of Singapore, for example, um, you know, what they say in public about China's threat, they're actually quite careful about because they're not strong enough to defend themselves against China's threat. And they're always going to live next door to China. Um, and, and so it's entirely judicious of them to be more restrained, especially in public. Um, but I don't want to single out the government of Singapore, but there are a lot of America's Asian friends and allies that want us to be more hawkish than them and want to look like they are being dragged into doing something that they very much want to see done and want to participate in the doing of, but don't want to paint a target on their own back by looking um, excited and enthusiastic about Especially because, let's be honest, the United States isn't that great an ally, um, right? That our attention wanders, see ref Afghanistan. Uh, we a lot of times say things that we're not willing to back up uh, or see Pakistan um, or uh, we will get consumed with a particular problem nuclear proliferation, and penalize countries, India, who we otherwise want their wholehearted support for our agenda on. So it's a complicated thing to be an American ally. And it's not necessarily bad that we are more hawkish than other countries in the region. It helps shield them in valuable ways, I think. One more point I would add on that, which is um, this, as you rightly point out, isn't the first time the United States is leaning a lot further forward on the defense of allies than they are willing to go. And that's a constant negotiation. During the Berlin crisis in 1958, President Eisenhower sent John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, to Bonn to meet with the German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, to assure him that the United States would go all the way to nuclear war to defend uh, the independence of Berlin. And Konrad Adenauer's reply was, good God, no, not for Berlin. Um, and at the end of the day, the constraint on American policy is uh, when push comes to shove, we actually cannot do more than the allies on whose territory and whose independence we would be fighting for. That's a natural and absolute constraint. So again, you have to my mind, your, your comments about how hard it is or how, what a thing it is to be an American ally are to my mind, a strong argument for um, 
you know, the French taking a step back to take a step forward, I think it is, reculer pour mieux sauter. Um, I mean, if, if you're going to go, if you're going to go Dallas to Adenauer, I'm going to, I'm going to Elegant. Go. It was very um, elegant, Heather. But um, that we would be better served by calibrating our military posture a bit more uh, credibly, particularly given that um, allies and foes alike perceive not just the Trump era, but the last 10, 15 years as a series of yo-yos, as you eloquently said, for a variety of, of regional and polarized um, things. So that's one point. But the point I wanted to make before as well, um, and thank you for your gracious patience with that and not pouncing on me, um, is this notion, the, the stance that we take Um, toward our security policy in East Asia tends to be the stance that we took when China was a rising power with a very weak military and consequently a realistically weak sense of itself in the region. And I was very struck the other day to hear a colleague say, oh, well, we lost the South China Sea. And I kind of scratched my head and I thought to myself, um, As long as the most populous country in the world, one of the two biggest economies in the world, is sitting right there on the other side of it, it was not going to stay ours. And so to me, the, the strategic posture that we've staked out is, is not going to be sustainable, not because anyone's a bad actor, um, and frankly, also not because defense budgets are... Um, a rounding error, bigger or smaller, but because the circumstances in the region have changed. And so I would prefer to see us again think, I mean, this goes very much to something you said, what can we actually do? And how can we be careful? Mm -hmm. I mean, because when I think about places the U.S. promised to do things and then didn't do them, I think of Hungary in 56 and Czechoslovakia in 68. And those are things I prefer to avoid on both strategy and humanitarian grounds. So I agree with your closing point, but I disagree with both of your major arguments. Um, the, on the first one, on the U.S. stepping back since we're uh, out in front of most allies, my experience managing coalitions in the Iraq war in 91 and the Balkans in the mid nineties in the Iraq war in 2003 and Afghanistan in 2001, when I was in government is that when the United States steps back, everybody else steps back further because our courage gives them courage. And so it's not true that if, we step back, allies will maintain their current policies. They're actually going to get worried that we're going to step back further, that we're unreliable, that, and they are going to make a series of compromises that aren't in our interests and actually aren't in their interests in many cases, but they will feel they don't have a better alternative, right? I think, I think we're seeing that in Afghanistan. We saw that in Iraq. Uh, we're going to see it in other places as well. If countries feel like we are recalibrating to shift more of the burden onto them, they are actually going to find ways to reduce their risks um, because they're not states as strong and independent as the United States has the luxury of being in the international order. So, can so I, in, I don't jump think in you there. should think that we recalibrate to where allies are and then you have a, a water level. What you are right. going to have is uh, decreases by others when they see our decreases. So I actually agree with you on that. And it's a piece of the, the traditional restrainer argument that I disagree with very strenuously that you can't, I, you can't actually just say, oh, it's what's wrong with the burden sharing argument, that there's not a hole that you can either the U.S. can fill or someone else can fill. So I, I actually, that, that is not my, that is not my view. But the counter to that cannot be that therefore we are stuck doing things that are not necessarily effective or that get us into confrontations that we're not willing to follow through on. And there has to be 
another approach where we can, together with allies, behind closed doors to your point about what being said, what is said publicly being different from what is said privately, but we have to be able to be flexible and creative enough to come up with approaches that, that thread this needle, because otherwise you're just endlessly, I mean, frankly, otherwise you are, you're creating the worst of both worlds because you're creating a case where we are very rigidly locked into what we're going to do. And knowing how rigidly locked in we are allows both our opponents to take advantage of us and it allows even more kind of allied freelancing and free riding, which I think you just have to accept as part for the course if you have allies, but why? There's no reason to maximize it. So um, if I may offer an affectionate um, uh, suggestion, Slapped which down. is that instead of saying we cannot do the following things, um, could I suggest you say we should not? Um, because it's a more generous way of characterizing what you clearly thought were my views. Uh, and I'm all in favor of more creativity um, and fluidity. But I think uh, what where you and I disagree is that um, you are arguing the United States is being put in a brittle position of defending things allies won't defend and that China is challenging. And I don't think of our position as brittle because what we are defending are uh, rules of order that are in our interests and everybody else's interests and that are neutral, not prejudicial to China. So two quick examples. One is um, the, uh, we didn't lose the South China Sea and we don't have the South China Sea because what we were doing was never trying to prevent China's influence in the South China Sea, which, as you rightly point out, is just off their shores. What we were and are defending is freedom of navigation everywhere. China can navigate in America's coastal waters. They do navigate in America's coastal waters and in the international shelf beyond it, because China, like the United States, signed up to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. China even ratified it, which our country ought to do as well, given that we abide by it and actually enforce it. So um, we didn't lose the South China Sea. We're not trying to impose rules on the South China Sea that don't apply to us and everybody else. China is arguing those rules should apply to everybody except China. And that's what we are defending. And that principle is really important Because if you let go of that principle, you actually are in the brittle position that you worry about, Heather, which is the United States has to defend everywhere freedom of navigation that ceases to be an international law and an international norm. Oh, I'm sorry. The second example that you are very nicely giving me the space to answer. The second example is... um, the ruling of the International Tribunal in The Hague that China was uh, seeking to control what are Philippine territorial waters. And again, this is uh, an international legal regime with an internationally accredited adjudication. Uh, When the tribunal found for the Philippines China refused to recognize the legitimacy of the tribunal. And again, we're trying to uphold an international order. We are not um, trying to impose rules on China that we don't abide by and everybody else isn't abiding by. So this, Corey, invites a pivot. There's a lot more to say about China, I think. But this really invites a pivot to the question of international norms and international order. And it is, it's great fun, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to do this with you, that you have just given 
a really lovely defense of international law, <laughs> um, which um, is something that I believe as a matter of principle. I also believe as a matter of observation and practice that I am a citizen of, and in the past have been an official representative of, a government that observes international norms where it suits us and disregards them where it does not suit us, as is the case for China, and indeed, as is the case for every other great power throughout history. As you said earlier, I will preempt you and quote you again, the lovely thing about the U.S. is that we have an enormous amount of space domestically to fight about this. And that if I want to go out and try to fight for the ratification of the law of the sea, I can, or to say that the U.S. is violating X or Y human rights treaty in its treatment of protesters, I can. And mostly with a few worrying recent exceptions, no one's going to put me in jail for that. So I am not making the kind of full equivalence argument that one sometimes hears. So do not come back at me on that. However, what I am saying is that we globally have the problem that we view ourselves as the impartial defenders of an impartial order that is just as good for China as it is for us, but the rest of the world doesn't see it that way. And so therefore, it is not, it is both, in my view, the case that you, even an international order that everybody sometimes flouts is better than nothing, because then the work you have is trying to get people not to flout it rather than trying to agree what it should be. But that you have got particularly, again, after the yo-yoing of, the, of recent decades, the position you have got to start from is a little more humble about the U.S. as the sort of great upholder of international norms, international law. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so I, I wouldn't agree with your example uh, because... The U.S. isn't the only country that thinks China isn't playing by the rules. Mm -hmm. There is a gathering consensus, and I think you see it in the G7 summit, you see it in the NATO summit, of other countries coming to share not just America's concern about China, but willing to cooperate with the United States to do something about it. So, uh, But your general argument, which is that the United States uh, is often a violator, uh, is true. Um, I, I concede to that point. I would only say that I can't think of a dominant power in any historical international order that has consented to constrain its power as much, as much by common rules and institutions and norms as has the United States. And that that is both essential to American power and what makes the order that we created more cost effective and self-sustaining than prior dominant powers have had. So I agree with the thrust of your argument that um, the United States attempted to create an international order that was a macrocosm of our domestic political compact. And where I think you were headed with that is that the norms of our domestic behavior and the importance of institutions in our domestic political compact are also important internationally. And that uh, we behave in a way that is short-sighted when we ignore those norms and institutions. And in fact, we damage our own case for um, consensual dominance of the order when we fail them. Uh, this, I also think you raise a really interesting point that our domestic political failures impair our ability to stand for and even to enforce those norms and values internationally, right? When Vladimir Putin can score cheap points by saying, but Guantanamo is still open, um, right? He's right that, that we have that to answer for. And we have other things to answer for as well. Um, and 
and certainly not just the tawdriness of President Trump's grifting, but the real genuine attempt to destroy democracy in America by President Trump and that continues to be excused and elided by Republicans in elected political office is bad for us as a country and it will make costlier upholding an international order that's manifestly in our interests and to which any alternative is suboptimal. So you have referenced several times um, the idea that where we currently are is trying to uphold an international order. And it is my view that, in fact, sort of slowly and then all at once, um, we actually where we are now is we are we are modifying and replacing that order piece by piece, not in an elegant Mm -hmm. way. You know, it's not 1945. Um, but piece by piece by piece, some parts of it are holding up better than others. Some parts of it are clearly not holding up at all. The Security Council, for example. Um, so the question to me is rather how, what are, what, what role can and should the U.S. play in its modification to, to whatever comes next? And then that raises two questions. One is if our domestic polit- if I, your your point that we basically tried to create a macro of our domestic political system for the world in the post um, World War II era is a great one, but of course, the system that we were practicing at home as we were trying to export it to the rest of the world was deeply flawed and deeply failed to to um, to fulfill its own its own promises. I mean. But it has improved itself, sort of steps backward, steps forward. Um, of course, I always make the point that you and I wouldn't have gotten to have these jobs and these conversations. Um, so that's one example of a, and far from the biggest one. But as we are now finding it necessary to adjust and fighting really brutally and politically, domestically, over how we adjust to make our society live up to its promises, um, my view is we're going to have to do that in the international system too. And just as um, here that is resulting in sharing power and influence in some ways that are uncomfortable with those of us who are accustomed to wielding relatively more, um, that is one thing that's going to change the international system in ways that are uncomfortable for those of us who were, who were reared on U.S. hegemony. But so to me, that is on net a good thing. And the reason that it's a good thing is the the second kind of secular development, which is a great thing that we should take credit for, which is that the U.S. did a great deal after World War II to help the rest of the world economy develop and grow. And so it was never going to be the case that it was going to stay forever that the U.S. was 30 to 40 percent of global economic power and that the U.S. was far preeminent above everyone else. The U.S. is now 18 to 22 percent and not far preeminent. So just as a matter of of, um, sort of cold, hard fact, power balances are going to have to shift to to reflect that. So the question is, we probably, rather than say we're going to defend every aspect of this order that we constructed in a very different time, we should be asking ourselves, which pieces can we build or be part of coalitions to maintain? Where are the places that people are rightly demanding change and we need to seed or help change happen? And what are the things that are competition, but maybe don't happen within the order itself? So um, I will gladly answer that question, and I love the way you framed it. Um, I I do want to come back to the UN Security Council, though, because you make it sound like that's newly not useful. No, no. Um, and fair point. Fair and point. It serves an important point, but I don't think it's a good example of effective international institutions that are newly under pressure. To your question about uh, should the U.S. decide here's what pieces of the order not to uh, contest and here's what pieces uh, to be adamant about. I think we actually 
have a pretty good record as a country on that count, in part because the, the operating system of the international order that the United States created. Uh, John Eikenberry makes this point really beautifully, that the ultimate success of the liberal international order is not requiring the United States to run it. And we're a ways from that. But, you know, one of the things we, we keep, I keep coming back to in this conversation with you is that you are talking about the United States as though we are acting alone. But in fact, um, the, we already share governance. We already share responsibilities. We already, you know, the, the restrainer crowd, um, and I agree with your judgments about them, always make it sound like uh, allies pull the United States into wars. And my observation, to use your terminology, is the exact reverse is true. The United States drags everybody else along like tin cans behind a wedding car every time we want to do something in the world. But the reason that they come is because they too want this international order. They too believe in the principles on which it is based. They too understand that any other international order will be less beneficial to their interests than this one is, precisely because the rules uh, that govern the order give small and medium-sized states a basis for contesting the choices of great powers. And no other order is going to give that to them. And that's why the United States has more help than any other dominant power ever has had in sustaining a beneficial order. Um, that we don't have to do it by ourselves because uh, the Netherlands, Japan, India, Australia, Germany, Norway, um, Jordan uh, also realize that other orders to envision or even complete disorder um, are much less advantageous to their interests than we have. And so I would ask you, Heather, what parts of the order are you thinking of when you think we need to let things go? So first, I, I acknowledge that was a really good hit on the allies point, just as, as, one, as one debater to another. I, 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 I wished I'd had a little a hit, a palpable hit sign. Um, so I will, I think, name some places where, um, in an effort to make up for that failing on my part, where I think our allies and partners are trying to change the order in really interesting ways that we are not helping with. Um, and the first one that comes to mind is the emergence of the, or the attempted emergence of the EU as a global power, and as a global actor that perceives its superpower to be norms. And if what we really want is a, a global order that is focused very heavily on norms and on norms that are amenable to um, Western society and um, the particular vision of civil liberties um, that the EU has, has cha championed so vigorously, then we ought to be a lot more supportive of that than American politics um, and American foreign policy practice finds itself able to be. And this is a flaw that is perhaps more extreme on the right, but certainly also found in, in quantity on the left. So that would be um, example number one. Example number two, you see, and in fact, many of the specific um, small and medium-sized allies that you just ticked off who have been trying their level best to drag the U.S. Um, like a very large uh, trash dumpster toward um, a different set of positions on climate finance and on an actual cooperative approach to both um, preventing and mitigating climate change, um, where they would, if they had had their way, and again, one can point lots of fingers, one can have lots of fun pointing fingers at Trump and Republicans, but 
this is a, a bipartisan or it's a U.S. political system problem. Um, the vision they have of how global burdens and global resources are shared is not one that the um, mainstream U.S. Um, sort of foreign policy politics is is ready to take on. But that would. But the the interesting thing about that is that it would be absolutely an extension. And, you know, a, a continuation of the ideas that inform the international system as we have it. I'll just, I'll just mention one more, um, which is the ongoing efforts by many of our allies to develop and enforce um, more norms around um, social and economic rights. And this, it, it has a blowback in a really interesting way that is actually relevant to some of what else we've been talking about, because we go to the allies and say, you know, you have to help us change some of the terms of how we do international economics so that our workers can compete with China. And the allies look at us and say, well, that's really nice. But if you were implementing any of the kinds of social safety nets that we have and that we've been suggesting to you that we support globally, then you wouldn't have so much of this problem and you wouldn't need to, you wouldn't need to go after Beijing for it. So, you know, those are three areas where our allies, I mean, just a fourth one that I'll mention, because I think we might agree on it, it's a little different from the other three is I'm really worried about the NPT, uh, the nuclear nonproliferation treaty that, that has been a real, it hasn't been perfect, but it dramatically slowed down, really changed what, um, leaders in the 60s thought the trajectory of nuclear proliferation was going to be. It's made life on Earth a lot more pleasant for all of us mm -hmm. for, for 60 years. And I'm really very worried about its future. That is just to sort of answer the question you didn't ask. When I think about what from the post-World War II U.S. hegemony order we do need to save, that one's at the top of my list. So I agree with you on the non-proliferation regime. So I'm going to set that aside because I actually disagree with you on the three examples um, in ways that, uh, well, let me not characterize it. So let me just, so on the first, um, so you are arguing that we should be encouraging the European Union to be a norm setter irrespective of what the norms are that they set. And, and I think the United States has actually been pretty supportive of the EU in areas where we agree with the norms they are setting and has um, focused our opposition on areas where we believe they are setting norms that are deleterious to us. So just to take one example, in my entire professional life, the EU has wanted American enthusiastic support for an independent European defense that will rely entirely on the United States in NATO to make possible EU grandstanding about an autonomous European defense. And that's actually where a lot of the friction about American support for the EU has come. If they want a genuinely autonomous defense, then wow, that would reduce a lot of requirements for the United States and be a great thing. Um, I would support complete European autonomy, but I will not support America underwriting the EU being able to set norms and standards in ways that affect us and that require our underwriting. Um, so, so that's one. I think it depends on what the norms are. And we have a pretty good record on supporting them when we agree with the norms. Human rights. Um, I think we in the EU have been partners in advancing democracy promotion in areas where we have common interests. Tech standards, we have huge significant differences that we haven't yet bridged. Um, and if we had adopted EU standards, we wouldn't have Facebook, we wouldn't have Apple, we wouldn't have uh, Twitter. And so the price that the United States pays in upheaval, in lower social standards for workers, which I agree with you, we do have, is that we have more economic dynamism. And uh, the U.S. is a more risk-tolerant society than most European societies, and we pay for it 
in less social safety and we gain from it in greater economic dynamism. Uh, and I think I'll leave it at that. I want to actually raise one question flowing off that, though, which is that we risk getting ourselves to a place where we say, well, we expect you allies to come rattling along like tin cans, um, whether you agreed with the venture or not, but you can only expect support from us if we agree from your venture. And obviously, the right, you know, I've just straw manned both our positions. And what you have to end up with is something in between where there is an expectation of a healthy dialogue and an effort to find a shared outcome. On, on European common defense, my point of view has always been that the U.S. could have gotten a little more bang for the buck by every now and again saying, yeah, you guys go work on that and let us know, you know, come back when you got something. Um, and that we might have been better, given the, uh, given the internal challenges to that particular project, we might have been better served to be a little more flexible. And on the tech side, just to loop back sort of to our China conversation, and then, Corey, I think we should finish by talking about how we see the domestic components of U.S. foreign policy, because I think maybe our biggest difference of all is the level of confidence and, and optimism that we have, that we have there. Um, but in my view, if the U.S. is going to compete economically with um, the Beijing government in the tech space, we cannot, just to, to, to flip the talking points for a minute, we cannot do that without our allies, both in Europe and in Asia. And in order to do that, we're actually going to have to get to livable shared views on some of the tech and privacy standards where we have so proudly held ourselves apart from Europe up to now. So in fact, we are going to, we're going to have to give up some of our vaunted um, independent spirit in order to, to get to some, some shared norms with, with the allies that we can defend. So you're, you're right about that. Moreover, I think American attitudes on a lot of tech policy issues have moved closer to European attitudes. Um, but I would also point out that your your straw man of it um, are typically where we start, but we also typically find common ground and agree, right? This is the history of the NATO alliance, um, that we, we have strong views, but in point of fact, when things feel scary, both the United States and our European allies feel safer handling those problems together. And so we find a basis for common ground. Um, the example of the U.S. withdrawing from the INF Treaty, I think, is the canonical one. Literally no European government wanted us to withdraw from the INF Treaty. Um, but the Russians were cheating on it, and we do have an urgent need for deployment of conventional INF range missiles in Asia. And because... We and the Europeans found common ground on how to do this and how to handle it. We got unanimous endorsement from our NATO allies for the withdrawal from the treaty, even in the Trump administration. Um, and so I think you shouldn't underestimate our ability to actually make those compromises and find common ground because we're that we are actually pretty doggone good about it. One of your examples that I neglected to mention, and I want to circle quickly back to, which is climate change, because I think this goes to uh, the difference in European and American approaches. The United States was actually the first country to meet its Paris Climate Accord goals in 1918, and it did it despite the Trump administration withdrawing from the treaty, despite regulatory rollback, despite um, all sorts of perfidiousness. And we did it because the great golden state of California set its own standards. Michael Bloomberg pumped a ton of money into cities all over the country to make progress. Apple Computer at its most sanctimoniousness, at its most sanctimonious, wanted to look like a good guy. And my mom wanted the world to be inhabitable for her grandchildren. And all of those things combined to push the United States to be the first country to meet its Paris Climate Accords goals. 
Um, and so we don't always need uh, other people to set norms for us precisely. And here's where we do agree because of the vibrancy of American civil society and the creation of norms, which takes us to the challenge, our closing challenge, which is the parlous state of our country, not just the challenges to institutions of democracy by President Trump and his enablers, many of whom remain in elected office. Um, uh, but because of allied fears that if this can happen here um, and we haven't defanged the snake that bit us, um, where does this go? And it is true that despite the manifold failures of my Republican Party um, and the continuing threats they pose, I am actually very optimistic about this. Because um, uh, the the United States isn't newly a country full of crazy people run by reckless politicians. As a historian of 19th century America, uh, I can tell you that we have long been that. But the loud disputatiousness, the challenge and repair of our country is actually how we move forward. And the challenges of expanding uh, access to, to voting, of inclusiveness of our society, of an, a passing of a white dominance in our country, um, these things are being contested right now, and they're interrelated, where you are seeing that what looks to me like the last gasp of uh, a kind of exclusionary politics in America, of a, a politics of scarcity. We're going to a politics of abundance. And it's a privilege to be able to help move that forward in our country. And it only gets moved forward by demands. And so... I think the terrible times we are living in are actually the politics in motion of us getting to a much better place. And it's contested, but I think those of us um, pushing against that are actually succeeding in a way that is historically significant. That's beautiful. I would feel so much more optimistic if I felt like if um, or I will feel so much more optimistic when you are running the Republican Party, <laughs> um, because where I sit right now is that I am concerned that there's a lot more dying gasps to go. And what that says to me is, is two things, both a continuation of polarization and civil strife here but also a continued diminution in the U.S. ability to be effective in the world, except in places that have, you know, not even a lowest common denominator quality. But I think we've seen that the, the temptation to run after agreement leads you to a kind of ratcheting up of tensions and jingoism which I would rather not have us competing over and I would rather not have us manufacturing crises to try to promote unity, which I think there's some temptation to do. And so that leaves me in a place where I want my Democratic Party to be, first of all, thinking very hard about how to not oversell to the world what's going on here and to show a kind of useful humility, which, you know, if, if the system we have at home has always been our superpower, then how we deal with our struggles at home is going to have to be our superpower now. Um, and that's a bit yeah. different, I think, from the, from the hegemonic impulse. Um, but also to, to think honestly to ourselves, if we are going to go through some period of time where we are going to be hamstrung by this kind of polarization and look more like 
a Brazil or a South Africa, a large country that should be really powerful on the world scene, but that polarization and weakened institutions have always kept from playing the role they should have kept. What, what do we want to focus on? What are the things we really can't afford to lose during that period? And how can we use this time to be putting, um, put it, making progress in, in key parts of the international system or putting in place support that will enable our allies and partners to John Eikenberry's point, to keep that part of the system going if we are going to be stuck struggling internally for some considerable period of time around these issues? Yeah, I think those are all important challenges, Heather. And, and uh, I share your judgment about greater humility and not just in the Democratic Party, um, that, that, you know, these are... American society is really struggling and deeply polarized in important ways. Um, but it is also true that the United States um, has been a major force internationally during a lot of periods of time when there were major domestic challenges and constraints. The upheavals of the 1960s, um, the United States did a lot of good work internationally in upholding the order, even while it was um, contesting it at home. I don't agree with you that uh, challenges at home create uh, an impetus to foreign adventures. Um, the, the political science on this is pretty strong, both that uh, it doesn't happen that often and it doesn't succeed when it happens. Um, I'm more worried that we're in a place that's edging towards the legitimation of violence at home in domestic contention. And the historical parallel that scares me is very much uh, the one of the decade in the run-up to the American Civil War, where you get legitimation for moving from political contestation to violence. And I think I see early signs of that in American domestic life that worry me greatly. Um, the, I guess the last thing I'll say internationally uh, about the international point is a passage from, um, uh, let's see, from George Eliot. I think it's in Middlemarch, but I can't be sure. Um, and it is what, how I think of the United States acting internationally despite all of our uh, domestic problems and failures, which is, Eliot writes, um, the important work of moving the world forward does not wait to be done by perfect men. And the United States is not only not perfect now, but wasn't perfect before. Um, and we still can protect and advance our interests in the world while acknowledging that we are fighting for democracy at home. And that's how we understand the challenge of other free peoples or oppressed peoples fighting for democracy and need to help that even as we strengthen ourselves at home. They're not alternatives to each other. Couldn't it I couldn't disagree with that at the abstract level. I think we could start a conversation about what it means to move history forward, but that would be a whole nother hour of conversation. <laughs> um, so maybe, um, maybe this is as good a place as any to close with that exquisite quote. I hope, um, I hope we've managed to enrage lots of viewers. And, but um, not encourage them to recourse to violence, please. <laughs> Contain your rage intellectually. Yeah. I mean, I actually think, actually, no, I don't want to finish quite yet, because much more important than Corey and I disagreeing about foreign policy is the point that if you have studied international affairs at all, or if you have studied history at all, you look at what is going on in the U.S. right now and you see what Corey said which is a increased acceptance of violence within our norms of political discourse. And you look at 
both the history of the Civil War in this country and you look at the history of the 20 and 21st centuries around the world, and that portends enormous amounts of suffering and enormous amounts of dysfunction, which you can care about if you care about U.S. foreign policy, but you should also just care about. Exactly right, my friend. We end in perfect union. <laughs>